You're listening to Tori Writer's She Said What podcast. I'm Tori, along with Marcy Persky. In this installment, Marcy has new studio gear. She will learn how it works. And adventures in landlording, or what to do when a prospective tenant asks to paint the entire interior of your house black. So the problem that we've all had with technical stuff, you've resolved on your end. Congratulations. Well, <laughs> your congratulations. And you know what's really amazing? Yeah. When what? when they tell you, did you check to make sure it's turned on? Yeah. <laughs> I always get mad when uh, Steve from India says that. Well, I mean, here's the thing. It was turned on. The volume just wasn't turned up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I do not know. I don't want to touch this new little audio box thing. Yeah, don't. There's many little buttons that I have no idea what they are. And all the little compartments of my brain are too filled to fit that in anywhere. (laughs) My brain has been excessively busy. Well, okay. So we've had a week off because we've been redoing your studio. Yep. And I've been, uh, I've been in that phase where you just start throwing crap out of the canoe. <laughs> Again? Again. Well, the spousal unit comes home tonight. He's been gone for several weeks. And um, as, as our three listeners know, we have this little apartment building in um, California where we used to live that we, we got to take care of us in our old age. And it never fails Like, you think you've got everything under control, and then everybody decides they want to move at once. So, Uh. yeah, so the spousal unit went out there, and and I probably should not tell this story on the podcast, but I'm going (laughs) to. Maybe one of our three listeners doesn't run from you. Maybe one of our three listeners is, like, not a lawyer. So, or a lawyer, I don't know what would be worse, lawyer, not lawyer, lawyer, not lawyer. (laughs) So, so we have one apartment that is... On the garden level of the building. But it being California with lots of hills that go up and down, the entire house is on a little hill. So to get to the garden, you have to climb up like six steps, right? Yeah. We get a request from a woman who um, who asks if we take Section 8 vouchers. Now, you know what that is. That's housing yes. support. Oh, yeah. And we don't mind taking Section 8 vouchers. No problem if the person... Except that you're not handicapped accessible, right? Yeah, well, we'll get to that. Okay. So, did I tell this story already? No, I'm just really smart. Oh, okay. We hear from this woman and... All kinds of little red flags go off because here's the thing. When you have Section 8 vouchers, there's usually more than one thing that's gone wrong with your life, right? Right. Because if your life's going along smoothly and you hit a financial bump in the road, you can usually make some kind of adaptation to to recover somewhat. But if other things are wrong in your life, it gets harder and harder, and that's the cycle of poverty. And at some point when you've been doing that for a while – you pursue all of your legal venues and you pursue all of the housing departments and you keep at it and keep at it because it's a big, long delay. And then you get this voucher that says that the government will pay for a big chunk, almost all of your rent. Right. And, and landlords are supposed to love this. But as it happens, and let me put this very carefully, some landlords, not us, uh, worry that The problem with the rental laws in some very, 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 very tenant-driven cities where more people rent than own, which is most of the Bay Area, you cannot evict anybody for anything except not paying rent. So if the person wanted to operate an informal daycare out of your house or they had 16 pit bulls or their adult kid who just got out of jail and hangs around with unsavory people <laughs> wanting to move in with you, or any of these sorts of problems that people who have stacks of problems might have, you couldn't say to your tenant the way you could in some other states, you know, uh, I think you're running a meth lab out of here and you're going to have to go, or I think you've got six 
uh, kids under seven coming here for eight hours a day and you're not licensed for a daycare center. It doesn't it doesn't matter that they're all related to you. You can't do that. And if you keep doing that, you'll have to move. You can't do any of that. So a lot of people for this reason are reluctant to take Section 8 vouchers because the one thing that you can evict someone for, which is the most likely situation that the person would be in because they're already in the situation of having no money, is never going to happen because the government is always going to pay their rent. It's always going to get their rent paid, no matter what else they're doing in there. And you can't say no. So some landlords, not us, are not willing to rent. But we are. We're fine. And we invite this person to come and visit the apartment. And at first she postpones because she's recovering from surgery in the hospital. And along the way, we're getting all kinds of little red flags. Like she can't come the day she's supposed to come because her daughter has dropped off four grandchildren and hasn't picked them up. And she really, really wants to move because her son is in an unsavory neighborhood and doing bad things. And she wants to get him out of there. And I'm thinking, oh, this sounds like the perfect, perfect tenant for our apartment. Right. But she does show up. And she is, the spousal unit is very careful with his descriptive adjectives. Big is the word he used. Very big. And Ah. these six steps are problematic for her. And so there's this little wooden railing that is to keep people from falling off the steps and into the garden. And she hauls herself with great difficulty up these six steps. And she makes it in from there to the garden apartment and she sends the person who has driven her to get some paperwork and the spousal unit turns around to like open a window or turn up the heat or something. He turns around again just in time to see her make a grimace and collapse on the floor. Oh my God. Doesn't hit her head. Doesn't hit her head. But hauling herself up the six steps has apparently been too much for her. Meanwhile, in her head, This place is perfect for her. Oh, God. And the spousal unit is going, you know, are are you are you sure? I mean, the tub is not handicapped accessible. There's no rail in there. It's got a sliding door, you know, one of those shower doors, which, according to the spousal unit, she would have a great deal of difficulty even closing. And I happen to know from having looked after somebody who was very, very, very big that it's also very difficult for them to keep house because – Let's say you drop your scrambled eggs on the floor, not even you with a grabber can you get that's right. So, but, but, but now not only are, would we, if we did, but we don't discriminate, not only are we not allowed to discriminate against people who have Section 8 housing, it's also even worse to discriminate against someone with a disability. What about a gangbanger's son? <laughs> what? Are you allowed to di- to discriminate against a gangbanger son? In California, it's also very difficult to discriminate against anyone based on their criminal record unless the person is a sex offender, in which case they pretty much can't live anywhere. So, aye, aye, aye. So, so <laughs> this very large woman who clearly cannot survive in this apartment and who from our perspective would be any number of difficulties – is bound and determined to apply for this apartment. Uh, That sucks. Any disability would be no problem, except that you can't get in the front door of the apartment. That's a problem. But it's really up to the person to decide whether they're limited by their disability. So the fact that she hauled herself up six stairs and collapsed in the living room of this place, (laughs) we, we cannot say, clearly this apartment will kill you. We can't say that. She hasn't applied yet, so we're really hoping that her cousin has maybe talked her out of it. (laughs) Okay. So one trip to California to rent an apartment out goes completely down the drain. The spousal unit is now on his way home. What One one success, one one complete and utter failure, and we've come, we we have been advised that the, the house we lived in, which is also on the property, is coming up for rent, and we're getting any number. This is what happens when you have a, a larger house, because our whole family mm-hmm. and our offices were in the larger house. Gosh, we sound privileged. But, you know, <laughs> this is where we worked. It was our workplace. So it's it's larger than you would just need if you were just a family because we needed two offices. So the problem with a larger house is that people want to operate like, 
halfway houses out of there, drug rehab facilities out of there, uh, schools for people who want to train performing boa constrictors out of there. I mean, I, I, we, you get every weird thing except we want to live in your house as a family or as a group of responsible adults. You get you get people who want their great grandmother and 16 chihuahuas in there. It's just unbelievable. And they ask really revelatory questions like, do you mind if we paint all the bedrooms black? So it's a mess. And that's well, been my I week. just want to offer yeah. to save you a lot of attorney money. Yeah. I watch a ton of law TV, like Judge Judy uh, yeah. and Hot Bench. Uh-huh. And it seems like Nine out of 10 times, they are landlord-tenant disputes. Yes. So I can give you the outcome. And I also watch a ton. This drives Frankie nuts because it's on at night. But I watch House Hunters because I just hate the people. (laughs) I hate them. I I don't want any of them to get in a house. Or I want them to get in a house and I want it to immediately combust the first time they go out shopping right now i'd like my house to combust but but right now yes, i'd I, like I, i'd I, like to combust that's what i'd like to do i know all these rules and laws especially section eight because of judge judy and hot bench yeah well let me tell you something judge judy does not operate in the bay area land of opportunity for people who've had minimal opportunity well she kind of does I think she left New York and she's in L.A. now. Well, L.A. is still not the Bay Area. The Bay Area. The Bay oh, Area. I know. Let me tell you about the but Bay Area. Before. You need to watch more Judge Judy, Terry Ryder. Let me tell you about the Bay Area. <laughs> there was briefly considered during the height of the HIV AIDS pandemic, and it was seriously considered uh, by the City Council of San Francisco that you could not evict somebody if they didn't pay their rent because they were sick. Okay. Now, can you just imagine what you're supposed to do if you took out a mortgage on a building and someone gets, I don't know, any illness and they just stop paying their rent? Didn't even well, say what they kind need, of sick. What shouldn't there be a second law if well, your tenant is sick? You shouldn't have to pay your mortgage. Yes. Yes, that would solve it nicely. But unfortunately, that that is not. But can you imagine just posing this seriously in front of a city council? Like, if you're sick, you don't have to pay your rent. Just imagine that world. I can't. That's what they take seriously. That is what they take seriously in the Bay Area. That if you and there's no, it doesn't say what kind of sick. Like you know, your hair is falling out for some mysterious reason. You don't pay your rent. That that would be a lot. That one didn't pass. But the fact that it actually was a serious proposal was bizarro. I'm, I'm the person that uh, many years ago when I was a single mom. With uh, four kids, I worked five jobs. Yeah, that's you. That's me. I mean, I was never a single mom with four kids, but yeah. And for neighbors, we could have had someone with 16 pit bulls and a meth lab. Wait a minute. You already had somebody with a meth lab. (laughs) Unfortunately. You've been listening to Tory Writer's She Said What podcast. And you probably know about my book, She Said What? A Life on the Air. Now, there's an audiobook, so you can have me with you on long drives or short commutes, and you can download it from Amazon. It also makes a lovely gift.